Schön, dass ihr da seid. Äh, falls jemand mich noch nicht kennt, ich bin Adrian aus Lüneburg, habe da meine Fechtschule Asteria seit 2013 äh, im November gegründet, also bald acht Jahre alt. Und ich bin meistens ja unterwegs und erzähle irgendwas zum Langschwert. Letztes Wochenende gerade in Berlin gewesen und habe da zum Zufechten. Äh, oh, by the way, would you... Pepin is somewhere, right? Would you prefer me to speak English or is, is German all right? Beide. Beide. <laughs> What about you? Uh, all right, and, and I think Pepin is coming as well. So yeah, all right. Okay, so I'll, I'll switch to English. Um, but I got my club. Uh, it's going to be eight years old in two months. And uh, normally I teach lots of longsword. And what I want to do today is show you some, let's say, principal rules of uh, approaching the, uh, what's called Zufechten in, in German, right? And um, I'll look into Capoferro for that. Uh, but, you know, when, when you get into a Capoferro workshop, then it's mostly about the fancy thrust stuff, like the Inquartata and the Passatas and everything. And um, when you look into the treaties, Uh, and look beyond those, uh, then you find there's lots of striking and slashing as well. And now, uh, those of you who attended Martin's workshop uh, this morning will find it quite familiar. Um, I gotta say, Martin's probably more into the vocabulary right now. <laughs> um, so if I struggle with uh, what was the term, um, please be gentle. Uh, what I'm trying to, to show you is basically uh, how to approach the, uh, the binds and everything to actually get into things like contratempo and, and all those, those ideas. And uh, I tend to do my workshops in a way so that these rules apply to basically any weapon that's long, long enough to, to apply these, right? So it'll probably not for, work for dagger, but uh, for, for long swords and even for saber fencing, you might find it useful uh, at some point. All right, so uh, having had a lunch break, do you not, guys need to limber up a little bit, warm up? Because I usually, I, I don't put too much time into like teaching warm ups or, or leading the warm ups. So I, I just give you some minutes to to limber up and then uh, we'll, we'll get into it. Okay. Okay, so let's see. Uh, in case you need some more time, just uh, yell at me and call me an idiot. Uh, but I think we can just progress. So yeah, um, Italian cuts, Italian slashes with the rapier. Uh, really close to what Martin told you uh, earlier about the side sword. It's basically uh, looking at it uh, historically, uh, it's really not far away from one another, right? And the, the tradition is, is kind of a linear thing. So in the Capoferro treaties, you'll find some words describing something a little different uh, than For example, the, uh, what did you call it this morning? Uh, the, no, um, this, this high point bind. Right. Um, the, the idea that's, uh, that Capoferro gives is, uh, is not so much about the, the thrust or the point, but Uh, the cut that goes from there. So um, it's basically the uh, the stresses or the focuses of, of the of the vocabulary might, might be a little bit different, but it's basically a linear tradition and pretty much the same, right? So uh, what we need to know to uh, work through this workshop today, um, the rapier guards are split into four uh, four principal sides or, or uh, angles, uh, always starting with the first, the, the prima, uh, which is basically from 12 o'clock to uh, 3 o'clock. So this, this upper quarter is called prima, 
Then we have the secunda, which is basically the horizontal and um, going, going down from that to the uh, vertical lowest point, uh, we're in, in the third, in the terza, and everything inside uh, here is quarta. So tarrying in quarta, which will happen a lot, I reckon, um, can be something like this. It can also be something like this. And then there's different um, words for these special positions and everything, but basically a peri in quarta uh, is anything that you peri on the inside, right? Um, cuts from the right are mandriti. Uh, you heard this earlier today. Um, so any cut from the right with the true edge is called a mandrito, and the basic cut is the mandrito ordinario, which is like uh, the right overhaul, right? So it's a, a diagonal cut from your right shoulder using the true edge. The cuts from the inside, from, from your left side, uh, are reversi. So a reversal can be a cut from your left shoulder. It can be a cut from uh, your left side going up. And then again, you have certain terms specifying which cut is exactly needed here. Uh, so for example, uh, an underhow cut, so a cut going up, uh, is a montante. So it, it's called a reverso montante. It's like it's going uphill, right? Uh, and a madrito montante. So we can kind of specify what we're talking about. We'll mostly use ordinary, so the upper cuts. And then, <clears throat> of course, uh, we can use the false edge, and it's called falso, which already appeared this morning. And so we have falso dritto, and that can also be something going up or down, but it al always works with the false edge. <laughs> and um, coming from the reverso side, it's mostly called um, falso manco, right? Uh, I don't know, it's not called falso reverso, but falso manco for, the, for, for some reason. So uh, if I talk about a falso manco, uh, we talk about a left cut with the false edge. Again, it can be going up or down or even horizontally, but uh, we'll probably not use those too much. Okay, <clears throat> so uh, having that framework, I first want to look into cutting and approaching in general. I know this is a really basic, uh, really basic drill and lots of people often find this to be a bit redundant, uh, but my position is it's entirely not. Uh, it's basically the mainframe that we need for fencing. So our first drill, we'll look into the uh, necessities of footwork when approaching with a mandrito ordinario, so a right cut, right? Um, and I must say, being here, and uh, seeing lots of people on this event that seem to focus mostly on one-handed systems and, and lots of uh, Italian fencing, some saber fences. Uh, I see lots of footwork much better in quality uh, than I see on lots of uh, other events like mostly long sword uh, events. So you'll probably find what I'm telling you a little bit uh, redundant in the way that, yeah, I've heard this before, but I want to establish uh, this kind of um, drill. So it's basically this. Uh, you'll get into position, um, get the point offline so I, I don't run, to in, uh, run into you, and you allow me to strike you, and then we switch roles, okay? And I want you to look at this. Um, striking from the shoulder, uh, we cut to the neck below the ear, and we want to make it as long as possible while not falling over the front knee or front foot. So we want to maintain a rather uh, vertical position of the upper body um, while still covering lots of distance, okay? And we do that by pushing the heel forward rather than lifting the knee up and throwing the, the body forward, okay? 
Uh, so what basically happens is something along these lines. Uh, I like I imagine I got into this somehow. All right, so it's really a basic drill, and I cut him and uh, focus on this approach, and then I can try and find out how long can this cut be without me needing to actually overextend myself. Okay, and then we switch roles, and you do the same. So I'll just kind of give you my uh, opening here. Exactly. So <clears throat> right now, uh, being the teacher of the workshop, uh, I can obviously point out stuff, but it'll be your jobs to try and see uh, what's actually going on here. So I can tell you, being your partner in, in the drill, do it again, please. Yeah, what I, what I can tell you is, your knee is falling a little bit to the inside, right? It's, it's the cap as well, but uh, it's a good position overall. And um, if you try and cover a little more distance even, that'll probably uh, get you into trouble. So if you get back into position, and now I withdraw a little bit more, and you still try this, it'll get you into trouble because um, the knee will bend inside even more and that'll push you off balance, right? So what we're trying here is to uh, position the foot and the knee in a way so that I can actually go very long without this being too wobbly, right? And the trick basically is to point your foot a little like outside his left shoulder, okay? And uh, go in a straight line like this and with the knee on top of the middle of the foot, okay? Can you, can you follow me? No? So uh, what I'm focusing on is the knee and the foot go like a little to his left, my right, okay? So I'll not go this way, but I'll go that way. And by that, I make room for my hips to go through the middle, really, right? Like this. I push my hips through the middle line and I, I'll be stable in this position. If I do that, it'll make me wobbly, all right? Okay, yeah. And you can actually overextend a little bit like this, but the criteria for this being a rather good motion in general is, will you be able to proceed from here? Will you be able to, from here, go further or even withdraw without having to shift your weight, okay? That'll be the next phase of the drill. So first step uh, is just to cover as much distance as you can possibly do while maintaining this frame. And the next phase will be like, I'll step e Phase will be like, I'll step even further in, okay? Have fun. Okay. All right. So let's get together. 
Okay, how is everyone doing? Are you having trouble with a certain uh, element of this basic drill? We just talked about um, the shoulder rotating too far into the line. Uh, so my, my basic rule here is don't show your opponent your shoulder blade, okay? Um, if, I, if I go in like that and I overextend, then he can see my shoulder blade. And that'll put me into trouble when I'm trying to withdraw from this. And uh, striking from the right will often lead uh, him to parry in a quarter in some kind, right? And he'll probably go for my shoulder because that's the most extended, uh, let's, go, let's say, good opening, okay? Um, and if I, if I do this, yeah, I'm giving him lots of uh, shoulder here and it'll be hard to turn while withdrawing, okay? Keeping in mind that there'll probably be a dagger or some, some like offhand weapon, I also want to be able to cover my attack with this weapon. So what actually helps with the, uh, with the uh, described way of stepping is that by stepping a little to my right, to his left side, I'll keep my hip fixed in a position that's pointed more forward, right? It'll be hard to rotate here once my knee goes there, it'll be easy, okay? And I'll like turn around. But if I go, I'm overdoing it, obviously, right? But if I do this, the hip will be fixed in a position that helps keep my body kind of straight. I will be able to maneuver my dagger even outside my right shoulder, okay? If I'll actually do it, it's a different point, but I'll be able to do it, okay? So that's, uh, that's what I'm trying to say here, okay? Anything else? Oh, you, you're new, right? <laughs> you just got in. Okay. Right. So, uh, with no further questions, the next step of, the, of this same drill basically is uh, you do the same attack, but your partner withdraws. And again, if you want to wear a mask, please do it. It's, uh, I, I find it to be it's such a basic thing and oriented on footwork and positioning of the upper body and everything so that's uh, for, for me for my personal experience it's not necessary if you feel uh, you should wear a mask then please go ahead uh, your opponent will withdraw like just a little step he attacks me like that and I'll go and make it a little harder for him to hit me and what you want to do now is with your little sidestep approach me directly with a thrust okay so it's basically like this you cut and then you thrust okay but the longer you reach in your legs the harder that'll be okay and it'll absolutely tell you if you manage to keep your balance in kind of in the middle between your feet uh, because if you don't if you if you cannot pull it off your weight will be on your front foot okay so what you will really often see is something like that, okay? It's why I told you not to try and drag your feet. Um, this will make it absolutely impossible for me to do a covering step with, your, uh, with my right foot, it, right? If, if I pull this up, I'll fall, okay? It'll tell you without fail uh, if you manage to keep your balance. And that's what we're trying to do here. I'm trying to cover as much distance and still be able to... And did you see, I, I did not shift, right? I just, I'm here, I sidestep and I push through, okay? Right? Go ahead, have fun. <laughs> There's your gear there. Anything? There must be something. <laughs> Where do you 
place uh, your weight onto your feet. Right. So it's like you go from the, on the heel and then yeah. place the, the balls or... Ideally, ideally, uh, what you want to do, ideally, is to be qu quite flat mm -hmm. in the landing. Because it, this ground is kind of good yeah. to, uh, to realize this. Um, if you actually push your heel down, that'll make you slip yeah. very easily, right? If you try something like this, it'll make you entirely unstable, yeah. so don't do it. But if you try, you push the heel out for going into the step, but then try to kind of flatly land, mm -hmm. um, it'll get you into contact with the entire uh, sole of your foot. And that'll help you recover stability quite easily. So that's the the idea that I think uh, is kind of the, the best way of doing it, all right? Uh, so for, uh, in other news, if we look into uh, more modern Italian knife fencing systems, uh, like, you know, there's uh, those guys from the traditional Italian knife fighting in it, um, they all stress uh, in any instance that it's important to set your foot down flat because uh, their story is, you know, there's a, a Genoese harbor and uh, you'll be a seaman fighting a dog fight, a, a, a dock worker or something. And it's slippery. There's ropes lying around and algae and everything and dead fish. And uh, you can imagine it. Uh, and, and that's the setting, right? So you want to be able to, to actually control the, the ground you're stepping on. And you can hardly do that with uh, stepping with your heel first or even with your tips first. So uh, that's kind of uh, what I think would have happened like 200 years earlier as well. Uh, because nowadays we have modern fencing halls or, or sports halls or anything um, covered with grippy uh, floors and everything. Uh, but even now on this on this lawn, y you realize it, that's hard to do, right? And I think that'll help realizing um, I kind of want to be on my soles most of the time. So as soon as I can. All right. And that's also the reason why I want you to try and not drag your foot. It's there's two errors in that. One is you lose contact uh, or, or you you risk slipping more easily. And the other is it shows that you will be on your front foot entirely. And if you compromise your attack for your reach, uh, that's always the moment in, in the fight when you will get into trouble. Uh, the moment when, you know, in, in the Lichtenauer glosses, uh, there's, there's this, fällt er dahin? You know, if he falls, and that's obviously, obviously not, he falls, like to the ground. But it's, it's this, he falls short with his attack, but he's overly long in his reach. And it's actually kind of like a falling, falling dead, you know. There's this moment when you do this, there's this moment that you can't come out of. You'll be able to rec recover. But there will be this window uh, that you can't get out of uh, easily. And if I see you do that in a fight, and I'm a skilled defensive rapierist, I'll wait for that. And I'll cut your throat, because that's the moment when you can't actually withdraw from any cuts or thrusts or anything. OK? Can you? That too, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So it's it's basically about keeping your uh, keeping your weight somewhere center and uh, being able to recover from any movement uh, that you make and ideally into any direction. Like you know, there's in, especially in the Capoferro um, works. There's lots of passata resulting from this kind of attack. I will somehow engage him. Let's say I'll do a, a mezzo thrust. And if he parries, I'll uh, do a carver thing. 
he'll probably parry again or try something fancy and I'll cut. But this is not the end of it, right? He'll probably, if, if he's like a decent fighter, he'll recover from that. He'll avoid it, he'll, he'll parry it. And then, for example, if he tries to parry it and thrust me over the, the shoulder here, then there will be the moment, do it again, please. Yeah, this will be the moment when I do a passata action. Okay, this is how I actually, to my mind, this is how I work into the scenario that actually gets me into this fancy, fancy stuff. Okay, uh, if I do it from a position too far away, I'll be, well, too far away to pull it off without him cutting me. I need to be really close. I need to be really, uh, well, he needs to be in danger, okay? And then at the same time, he'll, he'll think, this, this is an easy parry rear post scenario, okay? If I do it from out here and he does that, this will not work. I'm too far out. You see what I mean? Do you? <laughs> Maybe. So um, last weekend I did this Zufechten workshop in Berlin and we talked a lot about the proximity or the measure being a huge factor of the uh, possibility of involving him into something that's like exploitable like what I just did, like the Passata thing. But for my Passata to, for me to be able to pull it off, I need to be still in a like a stable controlled motion to go further from here all right so that's that's the idea okay any more questions did you did you find that kind of like rather tricky or did you think well i know this stuff <laughs> kind of lots of ifs. sorry kind of lots of ifs. yeah basically it's like dancing right <laughs> Okay, yeah, well, um, what I'm trying here today, uh, I said this in the beginning, right? I don't want you to, um, uh, to interpret what I'm saying as this is Capoferro's rapier fencing, right? What I'm trying here is I use the Capoferro treaties uh, to actually show you my ideas of basic rules in this, in this case of basic rules of attacking um, and basic rules of how to work my body physics for my better, okay? And actually what I want you uh, to do is take this home and work on it and uh, ideally we'll meet in a year or, or two and, and you'll tell me, you know, that was bullshit because, okay? Because that, that'll be an opportunity for me to learn and to reconfigure my, uh, my view on the entire fencing martial arts, okay? Or, and that'll be quite ideal as well, you go home and you work with it and you realize, wow, that actually helped me because that's what I'm actually here for, right? That's what I want to, to be, a, a fencing teacher who can actually develop your skills. All right, back to topic. Uh, this basic drill will return in the later uh, drills, all right? I think I should have a look at the time. Has, has anyone got a watch or anything? All right, so it's basically one hour left, okay? All right. So what we want to look at now, you know, we had lots of leg work and now we get some rest for the legs and focus on blade work. Um, what we want to look at now is the uh, the, the standard reaction of me cutting not to his openings but to his blade and that'll work for for saber for longsword as well uh, because it's a it's a kind of a natural reaction thing if he uh, gives me some line anything you find suitable uh, and try to attack me in some scenario I don't know a, a thrust or whatever um, then there's always the option of just making it a, a bind, like seeking the, the blade or of striking the blade, right? And even if, if he's in a defensive 
position and he gives me something like this, uh, I can always go and try and strike the blade. What happens in generally is two uh, like different scenarios. Either, give me a long uh, line, anything, either his blade will return, so if I hit it, all right, so what he does is a carva, right? It's cavazione, and that's the, that's the more skilled uh, reply. So what I find out in approaching him and hitting his blade is this guy is not entirely new to fencing and he knows some of his stuff well enough to reply to my approach of hitting his blade by cavazione. And that's a good thing for him to do, obviously, because it's a, like the more skilled reply, but it's also a good thing for me to know. Uh, for one, I know I cannot do what we just did in the first drill. I cannot just go in, I'll get killed, right? Um, but often, and I, I invite you to, to find out what happens and uh, try to be kind of as natural in responding in one way or the other, uh, so we get a feel of, of what actually happens. Uh, don't like reposition your blade because that's the drill. Try and like to on impulse put it back into the line, right? So like this, exactly. And that happens a lot. People, it's a lateral parry and people tend to do those way more often than the carvers, right? So both are fair game, it's, it's okay. But I want you to find out what's happening here, okay? And then we'll see and work out what is the good, uh, good approach to use one or the other for an attack, okay? Uh, so just to go one step further, if you, if you realize that your mandrito, the ordinario, is uh, cut into fluke, basically, what's the word? Uh, yeah? Uh, what he said. Uh, <laughs> Porta di ferro, right. Um, so, this is a cut into that, right? Cuts going up are cuts basically into prima or whatever. But also, false cuts are that. If I don't pull them through and like make a circle motion out of them, they are cuts into, let's say, ox, all right? And um, knowing that will help me with this approach, okay? So uh, you may try to do it with mandrito, like an ordinario, with an ordinary reverso as well and see what happens. And also try and do this with your falls uh, edge and try and see what happens then because that'll be part of uh, what we decide uh, to do next. Okay? Have fun. Uh, you may uh, swap partners if you wish, uh, just to have the experience of different uh, well, if you don't, then go ahead. <laughs> Uh, this turns into a kind of a play quite easily, right? Uh, we are all used to doing something with this, uh, with this kind of, of uh, impulse or whatever and uh, we, we kind of go into some consequence and play with it. And that's a good thing. Still, uh, what I'm trying to... Right. What I'm trying to teach you in the best possible meaning of it um, is to observe closely what's happening before you try and work with it on your impulses, all right? So uh, the Lichtenauer glosses, they have this look eben wie er sich gebar. Observe what he's doing and decide based on that, right? Um, so, yes, it's a good way of getting into a playful exchange, but also keep your focus 
on what's actually happening and is there a difference uh, for example if I do a, a Mandrito Ordinario or a Falso Dritto does he act differently does he give me the same reply um, and try to kind of take notes mentally okay swap partners at least for once please so you have the uh, impression of a different uh, behavior you can just switch weapons if you will Anything. What's complica complicated about that? Um, Martin, for example, has tried in. He's got uh, the angle, it's a different angle. Right. I actually go in without risking uh, to. Uh, yeah, I see what you mean. Can, can you do. Uh, over his head or beneath his body, but give him a good chance to strike at me. Can you uh, do me the favor and just do the, the initial attack? Again, show me what you did. All right, and now um, Martin, is it? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you act the same as before. Do it, do it again from the start. So you see that? What's happening here? Oh, all right, just uh, loosen up. What just happened there? He parried, he parried the strike before it actually could bind, all right? And that's, and that's exactly what I wanted to talk about next. So thank you. <laughs> so obviously to make a cut to the blade uh, worthwhile, I need to have a moment when I can actually use it against you, right? So what you have now is a position of both being ready and waiting for what's about to happen and then once he acts i'll in intuitively reply by a parry right so for a blade action like cutting the blade or, or striking to the blade rather um, needs a moment a window of opportunity that will get him to actually react to the to the contact and not to the to the initial uh, initial uh, idea of my attack, right? You see, it's a it's a huge dif uh, difference. If I just wait for him to to uh, strike at my blade, I'll definitely, being a halfway uh, trained fencer, I'll definitely not do that because it's obvious what'll be the what'll be the end of it, right? So I'll obviously wait for it to happen and then either parry or at least try and perform a parry. It's hard to parry, obviously, because he's striking to my blade, right? He's not going for an opening, so the parry will be harder to pull off, but it's still, if my, my reaction is I parry, he'll not get any work done, okay? And the same goes for if I just wait for it to happen and I uh, do a, a cavation, then the same applies, right? So this is, Actually, this is an in death thing, right? It's a contra-tempo action. And uh, that applies to longsword in just the same way. If, if he's there and we both just, you know, watch each other and I strike, then he'll not wait for my strike to land, whether I place it on his sword or on his, on his openings or wherever, right? Disagreement? No? Good. So, what we need for this to really work is a moment when he has a different idea of what's about to happen than I do. Ideally, for example, he tries to strike me with a thrust or a cut or anything. And once he does that, do it right. Once he does that, I get the window of performing my strike. So, I'll do this instead of 
just tarrying, which is probably something he'll, uh, he'll kind of wait for me to do. Uh, instead, I'll see and, and try to get an impulse into his blade. And that'll make a difference uh, regarding what will be his next move. So will he just uh, show me Cavazione and then go further in, or will he, uh, I don't know, put the sword back into the center line or, or anything. Okay, but the same works. Um, maybe if, if he's defensive and I kind of keep him busy and then uh, attack his blade like that. Okay, so it's not about being in a defense moment in a Nach situation. It's about keeping his mind occupied with something else and then giving the blade uh, a contact that's more than just a bind. Can you follow? Okay. You want to try and work it out? Yeah? So keeping my opponent busy in some way, like showing him anything and then trying to see what's happening is an entirely different approach of striking to his blade than just, you know, have him... You just saw that? He already parried before I actually did anything. So, um, yeah, I want him to uh, be like uncertain and the, the actual contact should be kind of a surprise. Didn't pull it off now, did I? He, he parried, right? I want it to be kind of a surprise like that. You see? What we need to do now is narrow down our strikes to make this work. So I can't pull a, a long strike from my shoulder to actually pull this off, like regularly. I need to, to give my strike a less wide um, window of movement, okay? But the same uh, idea still applies. I want him uh, to be surprised about the contact on the blade. Okay, try it just real quick and then we'll go further. Oh, there was a moment of realization here. Can you, can you tell us what you experienced? Uh, yeah, was, what I was trying before was uh, just going ahead and trying to hit him from this distance, right. which does not work. But you remember I told you that, right? Soon, <laughs> yeah, it came here later. So, oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> as soon as I made an impact with the middle of my blade, I was done. Right. Very, very, very easily. Wow, rocket science. But I had a realization there. Okay, and you were already going for the strike with this one attack. Yeah. Okay, so, so, okay, right. So what we're trying now is um, using his reaction to my attack of his blade to go in. So I'm not like a Zornhau striking and in striking uh, in contra tempo going for the opening. But it's still a good thing to do. Um, why are we not doing it, by the way? It's not like you should not do it, obviously, right? If, if he gives me the opening, if he gives me the chance to do it, then I'll cut through and, and hit him once the opening is there. But, and that's the problem, it's mostly not, right? Most times it'll not be there anymore once I reach in to strike it. Do you agree? That, like, wh whatever weapon you're fencing, you'll all make the same realization kind of quickly once you get into free play and sparring. All the um, Meisterhau and, and all those ideas suddenly seem to not be working anymore. And there's good reason. People know them too and they will react or reply to what you give them uh, so that they don't get hit. And uh, the, the most basic, um, uh, basic scenario of this happening is, uh, I don't know, he, he gives me an opening, like let's say he strikes a long cut, tries to hit me 
and I avoid it, right? So, and there's the, uh, the long sword word is nachreißen. Normally, the books say he tries that, he overextends, and I can cut after his attack. Agreed? And if he actually does that, it'll work. But if he has some training and some sparring experience, he'll realize in this, give me the strike, in this moment, he'll realize what will happen next, right? And either he'll try and keep it in hanging, or even if he cuts through, because his motion keeps him going, yeah, let's try and, and simulate that, it'll still be obvious that he has to cover this, uh, this opening and he'll probably pull it off just from, uh, from his uh, earlier experience of scenarios like this. And suddenly the treatise is lying, right? It's not working as intended. Um, and the problem is not, not that. It's not that the treatise is wrong. The problem is that my estimation of the situation was wrong. And my preparation of his uh, motion uh, wasn't thorough enough uh, to actually get him to this point. Because there will, at some point, be a moment when he actually thinks he can pull this off and do this overlong cut. And if I'm still like in balance and focused and everything, then suddenly this window appears. And um, I think we, we need to learn uh, reading the treaties uh, in keeping that in mind, right? Um, another example, just to, to uh, get you on, on my, my line of thinking, is the Abnehmen with the sword. So there's the standard Zornhau thing. Uh, he wants to strike me with an Oberhau. I perform a Zornhau. Just do it slowly. I perform a Zornhau. And then uh, it says, and wird er das gewahr? And that means he kind of parries to the outside, right? Um, dann nimm ab. And for a very long time, I was kind of certain the discussion description of Abnehmen is either cryptic, uh, uh, either I'm not, not like reading it correctly, or it's just not working. Because if I try to do this, I give him the point and he parries like that, and I just pull off and strike along the edge, then most times it'll be a double hit, because he'll, I don't know, go for the opening or whatever. And it only happened like three years ago that I was uh, free playing with, with someone I, I knew kind of well and we've been doing it a lot. And um, this guy uh, started parrying differently from what he'd done before and uh, differently from what I'd experienced with lots of people earlier. So he didn't actually do this lateral parry that we, that we discussed like just now, um, but he tried to win the bind by putting the blade onto my blade, all right? So I tried to cut him, he performed Zornhau, and he was like that, no, vice versa, right? So uh, he performed uh, Zornhau, which is my role, and then this happened. He tried to push the blade down to win this bind and get into a superior uh, position there. That moment, if we switch roles again, you cut me, I do this. Like that moment, and you don't actually have to pull it down. You just have to like place it like the Spanish do, uh, place it on my blade, because this actually is a pretty dominant position, right? So if you can actually go into it, uh, that'll, that'll get you somewhere. But trying to do that opens a window for an upnamen that is just beautiful and works as is described uh, in the treaties. But uh, this example shows that you, you have to get to a point of your fencing experience and different experiences with different fighters um, that actually gives you a realistic scenario of, of the description of, of what's happening in the described uh, scenario in the treaties. Can you follow my thought? All right. Um, so, while the idea is good, to uh, control his blade with striking into the bind and then going for the opening. 
Um, in reality, it's probably not working most times, unless he's a bloody fool or a beginner or whatever. Um, therefore, the earlier um, practice was to seek for his responses, right? And to, I, I was like, take mental notes of what, is, uh, what he's doing uh, when you do a mangetto or a reverso or whatever, right? And now we want to work with what you found as uh, like standard replies, standard reactions to your, uh, to your hits on the blade. Okay, did you, did you find anything to be like a standard thing? Uh, you had, I think, three different partners now. Did you find anything to be like to, to be strikingly common um, or let's say really special so you noted it? Martin? Uh, moving their hands towards my, my blow. Right. So presents an opening on the other mm -hmm. side. Or sometimes they uh, immediately try to avoid. Okay, and, and perform a cover. Yeah. Okay, so uh, let's look at the first example. Um, so maybe, okay, uh, suggesting we have this entire preparation thing, right? And I surprise him in a way. Maybe I try and do a, an ordinario and he'll, even before I really can get it through, he'll kind of close the quarter. And then you see his point going there, okay? So this is a workshop about cutting <laughs> and that's uh, what we'll do. Obviously, what we can, can do in this case is go in here and thrust, agreed? And that's a good thing to do. But we can do as well something like this. We carve and give him a passata. You tried passata a couple times and uh, most times you were like, you, you did it too early and you were really close and it was a double scenario. Um, but if you, and again, this applies to any weapon, right? If you find the, the right moment, which is while he's acting against the expected next bind, because obviously that's what often happens, right? I try and cut in here and then there's a bind and he can work with it. And while he's trying to have this, uh, this is a rapier that's new for me, um, I'll go out and cut to his wrist. Capofero uh, stresses that cutting with a rapier makes sense when you go and cut the wrists, the neck or the knees. Everything else will be covered in at least two or even more layers of textile. And yes, rapiers can cut, but, and if you, and if you have ever tried uh, cutting with, with live blades, I know you did just a couple of months ago, um, then you'll find out quite easily that even slight um, layers of protection can, can make a huge difference, right? If you cut tetra packs and uh, you cover them in one layer of, of um, plastic tape, it'll be tremendously more difficult to cut them properly uh, than without, okay? And even if you put them in a t-shirt sleeve or something, because then the blade will start slipping and there's all sorts of, of different uh, reasons why it's not working. So we cut to the, to the obvious points. Uh, if I can have the wrist, I'll cut to the wrist. Obviously, if I can have the neck, I'll cut his neck, his face. And um, I will take the knee if my preparation is good enough, okay? But that's uh, a different topic. So I try to open him up. You see, this is a good opportunity, obviously, to, to thrust into that, but as well, gives me the chance of trying and going for his wrist. And I'm not passing through into distance, right? So what I'm not doing is this. I'm not going for his ear because if I do it, He's still, my preparation isn't thorough enough, right? We had this earlier. My preparation is thorough enough to try and get his wrist, but it's not uh, performed well enough to, to go in for the, for the actual killing blow, okay? Please do it. And try, that's what I'm talking about here. Try to find the window 
of his reaction time, ideally. Well, it needs, it, it, it requests for you to be a little accustomed to the blade you're wielding. So it might be a little difficult like it was for me now. This, this pommel is kind of heavy and I was surprised uh, it didn't work as smoothly as I expected. But the idea is I give him this one impulse and while he's acting against it, I'm on my way to the outside. Okay? All right. Good luck. Have fun. Um, together. So um, I initiated this this workshop with the uh, with the mentioning of my idea that this should be um, a workshop on basic rules that apply when the situation is as required. Right. So um, if you want to help each other, try to be. This is the, the funny paradox of cooperatively not cooperating, right? Um, I don't want to be his perfect victim now, but I want to give him the opportunity of pulling this motion off, right? So I'll help you. Just put the, put the mask down, if you will. Um, I'll help you do this drill if I give you something that you can actually strike at and then give you my parry in response. Obviously, however high or low your skill level is, this may not apply for you to be a, an appropriate reaction in, a, in an open sparring scenario, right? I'm here and I see what he's doing and I'll close the line and he'll probably not get into that. But I'm helping him by giving him something exactly. Right. So he has actually I, I was doing it quite in a wide motion now, but he he gets to observe my response and by that gets to learn the uh, to learn to, to actually find this uh, this window for the for the um, for the precise moment of the attack. OK, you see what I'm doing here? It's not it's not about being a perfect victim partner. OK, I'm not I'm not doing this. Right. But what I try to do here is I give him the chance of actually pulling it off instead of just hindering his every move because that will not get him into the drill at all. OK, thank you. Do get a little closer so uh, I can lower my voice a little bit. Uh, anyone got the time? I feel like we're approaching five minutes left. Yeah, okay. Ten minutes. Ten, okay. All right, so 15 minutes left. Uh, any findings, new ideas, problems? You know the drill. It won't work so good with left hand if you're right. All right. <laughs> but it's not real, obviously. Yeah. So um, you had this uh, this idea of performing circular parries and everything, and I got in. Um, so what I'm trying to to say, the first part was about being able to perform long range motions, long attacks, and still be able of um, like still be able to keep going right uh, in any given moment ideally so even if I if I overreach to try and hit him 
and I realize it's not going to work, I want to be able to recover and, um, and my feet will be the platform for that. And the, the given drill with um, opening him to his quarta and then going here, uh, I mentioned that I'm not passing in, but actually going outside here so I can easily close this line again and then uh, do my next steps. Because obviously this doesn't, act, uh, this, this doesn't need to be successful, right? You'll quite easily parry that and then try and go for my shoulder. Or and then you get this uh, problem um, because here as well, people like to do that, yeah? To, to reach really long. And then it's easy, even if I hit him, it's re really easy for him to, to yeah, exactly. Uh, so by giving him my shoulder, let's say, uh, what I do is I, I miss a line for closing this, right? And when I do that, then it's easy to, to just so what you're recover. Basically saying it's better to, to encounter the cross guard or, or the, the guard than to get a successful hit. From yeah, the absolutely. Yeah. And it, uh, I keep saying that, mm -hmm. like wherever I go, yeah. uh, do not go for the hit unless you're like certain you can have it. And the, the Lichtenauer tradition says exactly that. Go for the um, Vorschlag, right? And once you have it, cut and thrust to his openings so that he can't cut and thrust at you until you see you can have the hit. But that doesn't, it, it absolutely doesn't mean I want to hit him on the wrist and I'll do it. And then you go and bam, because that'll fail in like probably more than 90% of the, of the tries that you, that you perform uh, because he's got a mind of his own and that's all right. At no point in your fight, it's his responsibility to not hit you, right? That, that doesn't happen. In, in, a, in a real fight, you're always endangered by his ideas, by his blade and, and uh, his initiative. So even if I get a Vorschlag, and even if I can uh, like build on it and, and increase my four, I always have to keep in mind that he might recover and push me out of it. And more often than not, that happens when two skilled fighters engage. So I'm absolutely saying try and get to the hilt, but rather strike for his uh, knuckle balls or anything and then recover and get get another chance of trying it uh, than going for the overlong reach and hitting him and then dying, basically, right? Okay, so that was the first element. And the second, and I hope we can uh, do one more, <coughs> is, yes, I can faint. And uh, most of you will have some experience with faints and it'll work him into sort of the same kind of position, right? So if I, let's say, I engage here and thrust at him and he parries, oh, he does a rotational parry, all right, that's, that's okay. Yeah. All right, from the start, let's say he does a lateral parry just for, for shits and giggles, okay? So I engage here and he goes into a lateral parry, then I can faint here, right? And this, yeah, gets me into the same kind of um, window of opportunity, right, for, for the attack to, to his wrists. But is it the same? Why not? Because you don't have the uh, blade contact. So the contact on his blade, if I manage to make it a surprise, if I manage to catch him off guard, like in the literal meaning of the word, and, and push his blade out of the way, that'll make him, and it's, a, it's an intuitive thing, right? It'll make him uncomfortable on an intuitive level. If I feigned him, that's something he might know and he might know well if he's experienced enough. And even a double feint often fails because he's like, oh yeah, that's going to be a double feint. Nice. Right? And we've seen it, everyone. Don't we? So if I apply, at some point, apply a strike to his blade, this element of surprise will make his motions 
less controlled, uh, probably wider. He'll, he'll like his rotations will be way wider, and that's that's uh, that's giving me time, and time is space in fencing, right? So I, it allows me to reach in further. It allows me to uh, to watch uh, what he's doing for a longer time before I actually decide can I go in or not. And uh, in general, it'll make my approach into the attack more secure. Okay. So, um, as I said, I can absolutely use this for uh, opening windows for thrusting, obviously, uh, because the same rules apply here. Uh, if I manage to, to hit his blade, his motions will be wider and uh, therefore give me more uh, space and more time to, to approach him with my thrusts and binds and everything else. Uh, but I wanted to give you one more example because uh, we had, I think we can agree on this being a kind of common thing. Either the, uh, the lateral parry scenario, right, I, I cut him here, or it's going to be a rotational thing. And then, uh, basically all I'm doing is I see what's the result of this rotation. For example, if I strike here, oh, give me the, give me the blade contact. If I strike here and he, and he rotates, uh, that'll again open a window, for example, to, get, to go there, right? And uh, speaking of cuts, I can now actually do this and cut into that. Uh, going, possibly going for the opening, if he allows me to do that. Let's say he's kind of, some people come closer in this moment, right? They'll, uh, like you did in your workshop earlier today, uh, they'll draw in their rear foot and then approach. Uh, so they'll make this moment a moment of attack, right? So if I do this, I can actually cut him off uh, in his attack and actually strike to the, to the opening. Or if he doesn't, um, then I'm kind of actually, oh, I, I did a, uh, an Unterhau, right? I can actually increase, did you see what I just did? I overextended my knee, right? <laughs> uh, I can actually increase uh, his willingness of performing a wider parry, right? He'll realize, all right, the first was nice, the second was worse, and he already showed me that his, it's likely he'll act in wide motions. I don't, I don't see him uh, pulling off another circular attack if I thrust or cut in here, it's basically the same. Um, he will probably give me a lateral uh, parry or something. Oh, so that, that was my bad. So, no, no, uh, you do the rotation first. And now he he already did it, right? Uh, he didn't actually even give me the chance to go in anymore. And that's basically what you did this morning. Um, once I open this window, I can decide either to pursue this path or if I see him parry that, I go and, and cut to his head. Okay, so let me say I am sorry uh, of not having, for not having more time uh, to, uh, for doing more of these examples, because I think that's basically where it starts to get interesting, right? Finding different approaches into the openings that I create by striking into the bind. Um, but on the other hand, I think with these basic rules that we just established, you can work those out, right? And it'll be, I hope it'll make some more sense uh, why I should search for this or that and, uh, and then find my good moments before I actually go and greedily try to strike him just because there's an opening I think I see. All right. So what I just did, uh, again, I strike to his blade and this time he gives me a rotational response. Let's not call it a parry, it's a, a response. It's a higher level of skill that's normally uh, leading to this. Still, his uh, ability to make it a narrow circle will be impacted by, by the blow, right? So I get some time and I can use this time for my advantage. And uh, then either, and that's kind of the, the final, then either go in there or realize he'll parry that 
and step out. And if I'm leveling my footwork correctly, then I can keep going from there, right? I can always uh, do one more. Okay, so do that and that'll be the last of it for today. Thank you. <laughs> Actually, uh, this one's in Capafaros as well. Uh, what he does then is uh, he tries and reaches in here and grabs this bow, <laughs> right? And then you can basically do oh, anything. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Gather around. Okay, uh, I say this is it for now. Okay, maybe gather around more closely. So one last round of possible questions, uh, discussing problems. Did you find anything? Uh, maybe like a light bulb going on or problems that you think need discussion? Maybe once again, uh, where you're trying to, to beat the blade. Right. Maybe that's useful for mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, yeah, we discussed it just in, in the pairs, I reckon. Um, the general rule is the further in the weak part of the blade I place my hit, the less impact it'll have. Obviously, if I strike into the strong, like into the forte right next to the, to the knuckle, uh, then that'll do not much. But if I strike, let's say, the middle of the blade, like this area here, that's where the most impact happens. And if I get, get it done in a moment where he's actually surprised by that, it'll, and even with a rather nimble rapier blade, it's, it's an entirely different thing in longsword and, and sidesword, obviously. Even with a, a rather nimble rapier blade, it'll often, create a very wide motion because the blade actually gets pushed out of the comfortable um, control, right? Okay, anything else? We just discussed the, uh, the issue of reach again and I mentioned, um, and that's, I think it's very worth observing uh, with whomever you're fencing with. If people tend to put their weight on the front leg and then try to reach, they will be forced by their own momentum, will be forced to put down their foot quite soon and uh, their reach will be way shorter uh, because otherwise you'll fall, right? You can't, you can't do this really well and intuitively you'll probably, if you start from this, you'll probably put your foot down really soon and by that you'll decrease your possible reach by a lot, right? Um, so the difference of this versus this is not only that I get into a lunge, it's that I manage to go into this wide step by placing my foot further. And that only happens or can only happen uh, when my weight is centered and I push myself into this position rather than topple into it, right? That's one more comment about that, like, um, like just the body position. I'm, I'm not so sure that the forward lean of the body is the principal problem. Even right. Though, of course, you don't want to be too far extended. Yeah. Exposing your, yeah. Your head and especially in longsword, it pays to be in a much more upright fighting stance. Um, but then looking at uh, Olympic fencing, like the classical sort of Olympic lunge. Yeah. You're meant to finish in this position with the leg perpendicular to the floor. Right. So it's 90 
yeah. degrees, and then with the shoulders wide open like this. Yeah. So you have pretty good reach with this. Yeah. But then if you watch um, more modern fencing, they're actually stepping further with the front foot and leaning a little more. And then if you watch Korean saber, I know. Yeah. And I mean, like this, this is. Forward. And can I recover from here? Yes. So yeah, if, well, if you're trained well enough, then you can. And the, the thing, and that's kind of, uh, you kind of um, turned around what I've been saying. Um, it's not about leaning forward. It's about positioning your weight too, for, uh, too, too far to the front. Yeah. Um, so actually, if you, if you, I mean, obviously, if you look into the rapier plates from, from different treaties, um, then we see lots of positions like that, like yeah, even like even purpose, further purpose down, purpose. right? But you exactly. Backwards. Exactly, and, and the difference is um, the difference between doing this and by that being with your weight, like yes. most of your weight on the front foot, the and doing this. Is, no. is the knee. It's if the knee is, is, is beyond vertical, that's when you run into problems. That's, it, it can be part of the problem. Uh, that has been discussed. That that has been discussed in fencing uh, science a lot, um, and yeah, I agree. Uh, it's yeah, I, I agree. It's often part of the problem, but it's often result of the uh, of the weight being too far to your front. So what I'm saying, you're right. This is often, if you look at it from the outside, this is often a good hint. That people place their, their weight on the front leg. Yeah, knee forward. Uh, yeah, but it's not that the knee is bef like further out than the than the middle of your foot. It's that your entire weight management is off. Yeah. You can be. I mean, Capoferro is the example of the long lunge in fencing literature, right? If you if you look into basics on fencing, then they'll. In, I don't know in how many books they have this plate uh, with the Capofello guy looking somewhat like this, right? And yes, the knee is further out and he'll, he'll be leaning way forward. He'll even overextend the shoulder and everything. But the, the basic rule still applies if you manage to, to keep your weight kind of between your feet. And you manage to do that by shifting your hip backwards. It's a difference if I do this and then push my body forward, I fall literally, or if I do this and I can still be really leaning into it, it's an entirely different thing, okay? Um, my intention wasn't to, to make it a how to perform a proper lunge only workshop, because, right. No, I, I agree. Um, like, like I said, the, the knee being overextended is a, a very good indicator because mostly it results from people falling into their forward motion. Yeah. And even, and even then you can see they, they will actually they, uh, lose contact with the left foot. And yeah, all I'm saying, uh, try it. Right? And if you find me wrong, then uh, please tell me about it. But um, the, the possible, the potential reach you manage to pull off in one motion is way longer and you'll land in a more stable position uh, when you keep your weight a little further back and you push out your front foot and thereby manage your entire pose instead of throwing your chest out, right? And then falling onto your foot. Okay, that's basically it. Anything else? <laughs> Whew. All right. Thank you. Can you, I, can you explain all of it oh, from the beginning? Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I, uh, I, would be, I, I would be quite happy to say this happens tomorrow, but no, uh, I, got no I got no second slot, so... Um, yeah, you gotta gotta take it away from this one workshop. Okay, I hope this was helpful. It was great fun. Thank you, uh, thank you guys for the camera equipment. And um, well, I'm I'll be happy to to discuss this uh, in more depth and detail if you wish. So yeah, thank you. Thank you.